We introduced access control in the previous lecture and we said it's about mechanisms to control what resources users can access. And we said that there are three types, discretionary access control, role-based and mandatory access control. We've only touched upon discretionary access control so far. We'll look at Today we'll just recap on that, introduce the other two quite briefly, and then we'll finish with some examples mainly about discretionary access control, which may be helpful for your homework. So we have entities uh, which are referred to as subjects. So a subject wants to access some resource or some object. And an access control mechanism will specify or uh, will control what subjects can access what objects. And the examples we will use are mainly the subjects are users, humans, or maybe some software process on behalf of the users and the object is a file. But it doesn't have to be a file, it can be any resource available in a computer system, but it's usually easy to think of files uh, and give examples with file-based access control. And with discretionary access control, there's some access rights specified up at the start when the, the system is deployed. So some administrator specifies some initial access rights, what a subject can do with different objects. And that can be specified via different means. So we can think of it as a, a matrix which specifies what subjects can do with what objects. So users can do different things with different objects. And the things that they can do we refer to as access rights or sometimes with respect to files modes. Modes in which we can access the file. Read, write, execute, own are examples. But other systems may have different access rights. There's no one, uh, one fixed set of access rights. But with a matrix, especially in a, in a file system, when we have thousands, maybe millions of files, specify, and even hundreds or thousands of users, specifying a, a large matrix for all of them may be inefficient to, to maintain because many of the elements may, may be empty or there may be some default values. So you can take that same information and specify it as either a set of access control lists which says for each file or each object what different users can do and if a user is not in that access control list then it gets some default access right like zero access rights so for file 4 user A cannot do anything because they're not in the access control list so that's a more efficient way to store that uh, access right information. The other way is per user. For each user you specify what they can do on different objects. So user A can do things on files 1 and 3, user B on 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on. So there's two variants in which we can do that and different different computer systems will make use of them depending upon uh, for example the, the number of objects and the number of subjects that we need to uh, control. And a fourth approach is just to list all of those access rights or access modes in a table, an authorization table. Any questions on those four techniques? You moved over there to here to, 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 to get away from there so that no one interrupts you, correct? Stay here and don't interrupt others. I want to sit near you. Okay, there's a seat up here if you like. Can I sit in your hand? Oh. Uh, you'll break it. You'll break it. Let's, we'll come back to some examples of discretionary access control, but let's look at the other two approaches. The aspect of discretionary, which I didn't mention then, was that once there's some initial access rights, the users may be able to modify them. They have some discretion to make changes. We'll see the others, especially mandatory, doesn't allow that. 
But first, let's look at role-based access control. With the discretionary access control, we said each user has some rights on each object. With role-based access control, we assign users to roles. And we say each role has a particular set of rights for an object. So access rights are assigned to roles. The roles may be job functions. So if it's in an organization, the role may be your, your position in that organization as uh, manager, director, engineer, programmer, depending upon the organization. So you have some role. And based upon your role in the organization, you may have access rights on different things in the computer system. Users may be assigned to multiple roles. So even though you may have one position, uh, for example, in SIT, we may think of a role as faculty member. So users have the role of faculty member. But another role may be uh, head of school. And some users are both faculty member and head of school. So users may take or may be assigned multiple roles. It may be static or dynamic. You may, the system may allow changing of users between roles. Sometimes we refer to a session in that a user has some temporary assignment to a role. And in fact, in the, in the registration system that you, you all use for SIT, you log in to the registration system as a student, and you can uh, see your own grades, enroll for, for subjects. As a faculty member, what I can do is I can log in as an instructor or a lecturer, and I can see the grades of the students I'm teaching. And say the head of school may do that, can see the, grade, the students that he is teaching at the moment but also he can switch temporarily to the head of school role to look at the grades of all students in the school. So that's an example of you can, for a temporary time, switch to another role. And we can talk about you during some session. And we can use an access control matrix to map users to roles and roles to objects. And the, the next slide gives a, a simple example. So we need two two tables in this case. The first one maps the users to roles. So you see U on the, the rows and R on the columns. So in this example it says in row 1 we have three users. So there are three users who uh, belong to row 1. User 1, user 2 and the last one, user M here. And in row 2 there's one user in this example. And User 3 uh, can take two roles, role 2 or ro role N. So of the roles in the organization, or more precisely for that computer system, we map users to those roles. And there can be uh, more than one user per role. Then for the access control, we define the access rights on objects, same as discretionary access control, but per role, not per user. So in the same way we saw with the discretionary access control, we can say a particular file, for example, is readable only by the users in role 1. Another file may be uh, readable and, and owned by users in, in R1 and so on. So these specify the access rights for objects by users in particular roles. This can make the, the administration of the access control system potentially easier because you specify the access, role, access rights, not per user, especially when you have many users, you just specify per role. Where often a role will contain multiple users. Other than that, similar concepts to uh, discretionary access control, but now we do it per role. So if you're developing a, a developing a web-based application, so you're developing the website, 
and you have many users who will access that website, then you may choose or even combine between discretionary and, and role-based access control. It may be per user, define the permissions, or you assign users to roles. For example, you all access Moodle, and your role there is a student. Similar, there's a role of instructor, role of lecturer, and role of manager or administrator. And they have different permissions on the different objects. With role-based access control, often there may be some hierarchy. And the hierarchy in the computer system is usually reflects the hierarchy in an organization. For example, in this case, in an organization there may be engineers in some engineering department and those engineers may be of different types depending on the, maybe it's a, a car manufacturing organization, there's production engineers, quality engineers, there's projects, project leaders and the director for example of the department. So that may be the organizational hierarchy and the roles may be uh, connected as well in the access control. For example, what we can say is that someone, a higher role, may, may inherit the access rights of the roles below it. For example, if engineer one can do something, then the production and quality engineer, which are at a higher level, can also inher inherit those permissions or access rights. We don't need to specify for them. And the director can do everything because the director is at the top. So you can define in the access control system uh, relationship, relationships between those roles. The project leader can do everything that the production engineer one and, produ and quality engineer can do, for example. It doesn't have to be like that, but many role-based systems will allow that hierarchical approach. There are other constraints that may be used in role-based systems. So like that example, there's, we can specify the relationship between roles. And there are different ways to do that. In that example, we said a higher role includes all access rights of lower role. So that's one way we can specify the relationship. We don't have to have that, but that's possible. We may specify mutually exclusive roles. So of a set of roles, a user can be only in one of those. You cannot be in two at the same time. And again, it depends upon the organization as to whether that's required or not. There may be conditions on the maximum number of users in a role. So the director, for example, only one user can be in the role of director. That may be a condition on the system. And the, the access control system, the software, will enforce that condition. Once there's a user who's in the role of director, it will not allow you to add another user into that role. So again, you can enforce those uh, requirements. For example, the maximum number of users assigned to a role. The maximum number of roles a user can be assigned to. For example, a user can have no more than one role or no more than two roles. And also the maximum number of roles that can be granted particular rights. So no more than five roles can be given uh, these access rights on these objects. So that these constraints allow, uh, allow the administrator to specify more strict uh, access control and especially related to how the organization operates. And there may be some prerequisites specified. For example, a user can only be assigned a senior role if they've al already been assigned a junior role. So role-based access control is mainly used in computer systems where uh, there's a strong relationship with the organization.
Discretionary access control we will see mainly used in, or, or is the main form used in, for example, file systems. When we look at managing files on a computer, discretionary access control is the main form used. Whereas maybe in, in computer applications, websites for internal organization use, then a role-based access control system may be more appropriate. So let's look at the, the third option. Mandatory access control. As opposed to discretionary, where the users could make some changes to the permissions. In mandatory access control, once the administrator sets up the permissions, nothing can be changed. It leads to much stricter control of the resources. It's based on the concept of multi-level security, which is used in military uh, organizations. So for example, it doesn't have to be this classification, but an example is that we can distinguish between different levels of security, such as we can say something is top secret, which is uh, at a higher level of security than secret, which is a higher level than confidential, versus restricted versus unclassified. So that's just one example of the different levels of security. We may have other names or, or more or less number of levels. But given that we define a set of levels of security, where it's always such that one is greater than the other in, in, the, in terms of security, we still have subjects and objects. So the subjects are the users, the objects are the resources we want to control access to. And the subject is given some security clearance. So the user is, is specified to have some clearance at a particular level. For example, a user could be given a clearance at the level of secret or at the level of restricted. So users or subjects are given a, a clearance at some level and an object, the resource we want to control, is classified at a particular level. So a, an object may be classified as confidential or unclassified, which is the lowest level in this example. And so we need both of them and the administrator of the system would define the security clearances and the classifications up front. If we jump back to one of our first slides, remember access control controls what the users can do with resources for it to work, there needs to be some authorization database that, that specifies these access rights. For example, the matrix, the, the access control list, or specifies in mandatory access control the, the clearance levels and the classification levels. So there's some administrator who does that up, the, up front. So once the administrator specifies that the subjects are cleared at some level and the objects are classified at some level, then to maintain confidentiality there's two, two properties that are required. The first is maybe the most obvious one, there's the property of no read up, which means that a subject can only read an object of less or equal security level. That is, the subject with a particular clearance can only read objects which, with that clearance or lower, uh, with that classification or lower. That is, if the subject is cleared at confidential, they can read resources which are either confidential, restricted, or unclassified. A subject which is cleared at confidential cannot read resources which are classified as secret or top secret. So you cannot read up in terms of the levels. Does that one make sense? So now we think of uh, our resources are classified at some level. So we have a file and we say this file is classified as confidential. 
This other file is classified as restricted, and this third file is classified as top secret. So we classify our resources. And similar with users, we clear them to a particular level. This user is cleared to secret, this other user is cleared to classified. So that happens at the start. And we have a requirement that a subject with a particular clearance can only read objects which are classified at that level or lower levels. If I'm cleared to be, if I'm cleared at confidential, I can read any confidential document, I can read any restricted document or any unclassified document, but I cannot read up security of secret documents or top secret. Once again, this is just an example of these names of levels. There may be more and they may be different names, but the example was common in uh, government or military organizations. Any questions so far on no read up? The other one, which maybe is not so obvious at the start, is the, the property of no write down. A subject cannot write, so write means modify, be delete, cannot write into an object of greater or equal security level. If I am classified as secret, can I read a confidential document? Yes or no? I am classified as secret, can I read a confidential document? Yes, the property of no read up allows me to read the ones lower. Okay. If I'm classified at the secret level, can I modify a confidential document? I cannot modify a confidential document. I can read it, but I cannot modify it. So again, if I'm classified as secret, I can read a confidential document, but I, the no write down property says I cannot modify or write that confidential document. Why is that? Why? So I, I'm allowed to read it, but I'm not allowed to write it or write to that level. What's the reason for that no write down property? It's, again, this is mandatory access control. The, the permissions which are set up at the, at the start, the users are not allowed to change them. And the no write down property ensures that a user doesn't release information at one level down to the lower level. That is, if I read a secret document, I'm at the secret clearance level and I read a secret document and then I try to write a document at the confidential level, that leads to the possibility that I release the secret information down to people who are classified just at confidential. So I'm not allowed to create, you can think I'm not allowed to create confidential documents in that case because it leads to the possibility that I'll release information from a higher level down to the lower levels. So it's quite strict on that requirement. Does that one make sense? So this is to ensure that we do not release information from one level down to people who do not normally have the permission to read that information. I can read a secret document because I have secret clearance, but if you're at the confidential clearance, you cannot read a secret document. But if the system allows me to write a document, create a document at the confidential level, then it potentially allows me to take the secret information that I can read and release it at a lower level, confidential for example, and that's a problem. So mandatory access control and the no write down property builds in a mechanism 
to stop people releasing information from one level down to other levels. Questions on mandatory access control. Very brief on this one. It's primarily used where we need a, uh, a strong or a high level of security. So if we think of c computer systems, uh, in cases when we want to be very certain of the security, it, it may be used as opposed to role-based or discretionary access control. Note that the clearance and classification is determined by some administrator, and the users, the subjects, cannot override that policy. So they don't have the discretion to change things. There are some, some models, mathematical models, that allow more formal analysis and proof that, that certain properties are met. That's all we'll say about mandatory access control. There are, it's not common by default, for example, in file systems, but it is usually available as an option. So if you install your, computer, uh, your operating system on your computer, usually the file system will use discretionary access control. Okay. And we'll see more examples of that. But often there are implementations of mandatory access control that you can choose as an option. For example, different operating systems have different software available to, to have this more secure a level of permissions on, on files. So Windows, uh, uh, OS X and, and Linux operating systems all have their own variants of software that will implement mandatory access control where you can specify those levels. They don't have to be named these five or six levels, but you can specify them and be much stricter on what can change in terms of the access control leading to a much, much, potentially much more secure system. Questions? Got a question? Do I open the microphone for question? Yes, I did, but it's not very loud, is it? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Good. Any other questions about the topic? <laughs> Maybe you didn't hear the last 10 minutes, and that's why there are no questions. So be aware of the differences between those three approaches of discretionary. And discretionary, we'll see some more examples in a moment. Discretionary, we can change the, the permissions. Role-based is similar to, to, to discretionary, but we do it per role, not per user. And mandatory access control, where we have these stricter requirements, which is much more useful for uh, systems that need higher levels of security. We'll, come, we'll go to an example of discretionary access control, which will help for the assignment in a moment, but let's just lead uh, and summarise uh, to finish this presentation. So what is access control? It's a, uh, it's a means for preventing unauthorised use of resources. Objects are referred to here. The resources or the objects can be files, and we'll use examples of files a lot, but they may be other things. Database records, so rows in a database, for example. Uh, parts of a disk, sectors or blocks of a disk. Memory, uh, software processes, and, and any type of resource that our computer system may, may offer the users. And we have subjects. Subjects are, although we talk about users and human users, usually for a computer system, it's a soft piece of software running on behalf of the user. Okay, so uh, a software process. And we may have different classes of subjects. And we'll see this in a bit more, but we, in some file systems, we talk about the owner of a, a, 
object. We may talk about groups of users or all users in the system and some different classes of subjects. And the access rights, again, there are different access rights, but uh, we'll see common ones like we can read a resource, we can write or modify, execute. Um, maybe sometimes write includes delete, sometimes it doesn't. So there may be a separate delete access right. Uh, in databases, for example, if you set up a database, then you'll see that you can grant different permissions, including to create tables, to create different entries. In discretionary access control, the rights are granted to the subjects. It's very common in operating systems in databases. Role-based access control, the subjects take a role and the rights are assigned to those roles. So common in, in applications that are uh, uh, closely aligned with the organisation. And mandatory access control, where the subjects and objects are assigned to levels and the subjects, the users, cannot modify that assignment. So we, it's fixed, it's mandatory as to what's the, the administrator sets. There may be different security issues, but one main issue is that all of this relies on the administrator setting up the permissions correctly at the start. So in all of these three me mechanisms, someone has to initially set what access rights those users, roles or, or levels have. So if they make a mistake, then that may lead to a compromise of the security of the system. And things that we do not talk about which are related and somewhat interesting are things like trusted computing so, and secure boot, which is related, to te or techniques to make sure that uh, from the time when you boot your computer system, when it starts, through to when it loads applications and allows users to do things, that it's all those steps are, uh, can be trusted, that no attacker can compromise one of those steps and which may lead to later compromises. So there are mechanisms to add much higher level of security than what we currently have in our, uh, our common computer systems.